Hi there. Welcome. We look forward to you joining us as we, uh, the Bearded Bible Brothers, have a conversation. I am your bearded host, Josiah Marshall. And I'm your other bearded host, Matt Crosswhite. We like beards. <laughs> we love beards. Yes, we and do. if you if you are not a bearded person, either because you are a female or because you choose to shave your chin every morning, we do not hold that against you. You are still welcome here, but we have beards and we are fond of them. Yes, we are. We are not scholars, but nor are we uh, trained individuals in the topics that we'll be discussing, but... Uh, we are just two brothers who enjoy having these conversations and look forward to you joining us in them. Um, and if you have any negative comments, comments, whatever they may be, we look forward to you sending them in and joining our, in, our, in our conversation uh, in the episodes to come. So, so let's jump in together and start today's study. everyone and welcome to another episode of bearded bible brothers i'm your bearded host matt and i'm your... by bearded host josiah sorry <laughs> that's all right go ahead and jump in there josiah hey nice to have you guys all back here and matt it's just always great to have a conversation with you my brother likewise likewise and today we have a fun one mm -hmm. we're still in our seven part series on eschatology in kind of the, the book of revelation and so today we are going to talk about the seven letters to the seven churches found in Revelation, Revelation, excuse me, chapters two and three. Right. So let's let's jump in. What do you what do you think about the letters, Josiah? Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're going to cover all of this in one episode, and he starts off with a loaded question. Um, yeah. I think in a snapshot. These churches provide a, a glimpse into human behavior, human psychology, and relationships, especially the relationship of believer and, between believer and God in this case, especially with Jesus using the very telling um, statement that I'm going to remove the menorah that represents your community. So um, I think that pretty much nails a, just a general snapshot of what I see taking place in these, in these churches and, and your background in, in psychology. I mean, I'm sure you could see a array of stuff that's popping up in this. Not only do you have the behavior of the, of the believers, but you've also got the influence of the cities, the religious centers that they can be, uh, the social factors involved in just influencing not only the believers, but the larger city at large and what it's right. also what it's doing to the community and what it's causing them to do and influencing them to do. So absolutely. Let's turn that back and qu question back to you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what do um, you see? Um, I agree the, there's a lot in there of, of how the churches are struggling with their culture and what's going on around them. Mm -hmm. um, of the seven, there are only two that don't have a disciplinary or or corrective instruction from jesus the churches of smyrna and philadelphia only have positive things said about them but they are the only two which kind of flows with the theme throughout the new testament and most of paul's epistles are uh corrective in nature there's only a couple that are hey you guys are doing great keep it up right um but i think that in in studying through the letters it was very surprising and, and telling for me of how every single one of the churches in what is now uh, the Western half of modern day Turkey, mm -hmm. every single one was struggling with how to not compromise and become like the Gentile population that they lived around mm -hmm. and how to not become uh, compromise in faith in in Jesus as the the one true way right and not become Jewish for the sake of having a community wrapped around you having the tax benefits and the religious exemptions from Rome 
Mm-hmm. They had they were struggling to walk a fine line between not compromising in the culture and not compromising by becoming a different culture, becoming Jews in order for for the persecution to stop. Mm-hmm. 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 Indeed, uh, so in, my, in doing some research on this, the the historical elements that took place in in these cities um, was really quite fascinating, especially when you see Ephesus. Um, you, you see a city that um, was a center, a hub, w- probably considered the grandest of all those cities. And even in that city, there was a temple to Artemis, and um, that temple was considered one of the great wonders of the ancient world. And then Smyrna, I, I, I thought Smyrna was quite fascinating because Smyrna was nearly completely destroyed at one point, yet it came back. And so even the language that's used in the letter to Smyrna is quite interesting because it's when you read the letters and you see the introduction of Jesus and who he is, there's different elements and perspectives that, that people go at. Well, specifically John here is seeing Jesus in, in, in a few different lights. And when it comes to Smyrna, you see that there's this element of first and last. And in the concept of that in scripture is that it's ongoing and that it, it's not right. ending. And the fact that Smyrna is yeah, exactly. Eternal. So the fact that uh, you even see this element of death and alive coming back to life again, Smyrna is still the only city that's still around. But then within each of these letters, it's just so fascinating to find that there is an element of Jesus at work here and that there's a theme in each one taking place and how even I don't like to reduce things too much. Um, I think yeah. that there can be a tremendous loss in what could be a general simplicity of things. But in, in looking over these letters, I did. Uh, there's a common aspect in uh, scriptural study, and um, you've probably heard this before, and where you have a key word, right? Mm-hmm. And in, in looking over these letters, I did find some key words, especially with Smyrna, there was this key word of life and life yeah. abundant. And so in doing that, you end up seeing how these letters ends up a, 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 a more of a snapshot connection between human behavior and elements of the gospel ranging from Genesis to um, the New Testament. Everything right. that's encapsulated within these churches, you can see repeated through a pattern in various other places in Scripture. And it just continues to reinforce and re, re, revitalize, I think, this understanding we have of Jesus. Because what does the very first verse say in, uh, in Revelation? This is something about the Messiah. This is the Messiah. This is who we're dealing with here. And so one of the, the things that I thought was some, some quite fascinating was that there is a tremendous amount of focus put on Laodicea. And I was curious about what your take on specifically this church of Laodicea and why it could have such an overwhelming interest, especially within the evangelical circles. I mean, you've got everything from songs from Steve camp to uh, uh, visual references that's even been used in recent movies related to Pilgrim's progress. So I was just curious what, what your take on that specific church was. Well, that one, yeah, that, that's the one that most of us are familiar with, like you said, mm-hmm. uh, from the, the culture of evangelicalism. And if you if you abide by the theory, pretty much everybody agrees that these were seven literal churches mm-hmm. in Asia Minor. Mm-hmm. And also pretty much everybody agrees that you can find elements of, of uh, whatever congregation you particularly attend mm-hmm. might look more like some of these than others. Right. Um, but there's a third theory that I've heard taught and I've done research on in this, that the, the letters to the seven churches chronicle in advance mm-hmm. all of church history, starting with the mm-hmm. early church losing their first love, which is the letter to Ephesus, mm-hmm. and then the persecution starting with Smyrna. An interesting note on this theory is the, the ten what does Jesus say to the church of Smyrna? Is it 10 days? Let's see. Um, do not fear what you're about to suffer. Seven. The devil is about to throw some of you into prison right. so that you will be tested and you'll have tribulation for 10 days. Right. So pe- 
people who hold to this theory note that there were 10 Roman emperors who conducted significant persecution against, against mm -hmm. the way or against Christianity. Mm -hmm. So, and as you go through, there's, um, Philadelphia would, they say would represent the, the missionary church of the late 1700s, early 1800s, where mm -hmm. the gospel is going out to the ends of the earth, which puts us modern day in Laodicea, which is, it's interesting. All of the churches up to Laodicea are experiencing the tension of, do we compromise with culture? Do we become Jewish or do we stay on the path of, of living in the tension between them and not really having a community around us, mm -hmm. experiencing persecution on both sides. Right. Laodicea ha is the only one of all of the churches who has completely compromised. Mm. And they're the ones to whom Jesus says, you think you're good to go. You think you're wealthy. You think you have all of these blessings. Mm -hmm. And much like Job's friends, they say, your, your circumstances are bad. Therefore, you must have upset God, which is a very common religious belief within and outside of Christianity. If yeah. life is not going well for you, you must have upset God or the gods. And so they're almost doing the flip. Things are going well for us materially and culturally. Therefore, God must be happy with us. And he says the exact opposite. You guys think you're good to go. You think you're rich, but you're actually extremely poor. You think you're well clothed, but you're absolutely naked. So you, you think uh, one of the things about Laodicea as a location, they were very good uh, medically in some of the, the coins that have been found in right. archaeology. It has mm -hmm. the pictures of some of the doctors on it. And specifically the eye salve that they have, that they invented or, or produced. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says, you think that you can see, but you're actually blind. Mm -hmm. And he uses all of those things to say, come back to me. Anyone who comes back, it's not too late. I'm standing at the door. I'm knocking. I want to come in and dine with you, right. which in, in Middle Eastern and collectivist culture, that's a big deal. It's not just, hey, let's grab a bite to eat. That's, I want to come and be with you. But yeah, um, mm -hmm. culturally, mm -hmm. I think that I think that that's why we see so much emphasis on Laodicea in evangelicalism, modern. Yeah. And I don't know that it's unfounded. I don't think it is either, um, especially when you, you you definitely, as you were talking about there a minute ago, this hot and cold element that that, that we see at work. Um, I remember one time years ago, um, I think it was in a class of some kind. Anyways, there was uh, this information provided that around Laodicea were um, thermal pockets and that these created um, sort of like um, uh, what you see at Yellowstone um, or even out in Hawaii on, on, on uh, Mount uh, Haleakala with the, uh, excuse me, not, 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 excuse me, not, not Maui, the, uh, the big island. And you got the volcanoes and you got okay. all these steam pots going on. And so I think that's quite common that you're going to take something quite grounded in reality and you're going to use it as a message to get your message across to say the least but one of the other things that i think that that's definitely appealing for laodicea is that it has more of a philosophical bent um i I'm tr i was trying to remember which one I, I i i one of them said that um return to your first love ephesus that's ephesus that's right yeah, that's right and um, and then you go on to Sardis and you see uh, what he he says. I know what you are doing, um, and you got this other element throughout all of these things that there's an element of action at work. And um, one of the reasons why I always thought Laodicea was just so in, intriguing for, well, in, not just intriguing, but I think even personal on some levels for modern Christians was because they could identify with the message. Um, yeah. Modern Christians tend to have this ability, and I, I think a reason to uh, personalize with the letter, um, because it tends to give language to how they're feeling. They feel hot and cold. They feel like they're being tossed about, even as James talks about. But um, so for even for me, being growing up in a Christian environment, it was a lot of self-analyzation. Wow. Self, it's a lot of self-analyzation and um, self-reflection. And yeah. I, you ever heard of uh, newspaper exegesis? 
Yes. And yes. I think that's an element that's going on here to some degree, but it's more of an eisegetical newspaper, eisegesis, in that you're reading yourself into it or something out of it for you, then generally what's being dis- being discussed here, I-, I think more specifically, that there can be both a symbolic as well as a um, real-life objective approach to these things and a real-life application. Mm-hmm. I think there are some – I've even heard some people say, well, there was no Laodicea. There was no Smyrna. There was no, there was no Ephesus. The entire book of Revelation is entirely metaphor and that somebody created these. It's like yeah, I, I can't I can't agree to that. Um, primarily because not only do we have the archaeological evidence, but we've got the standard, the canonization of something that we've come to understand as a standard of truth. And right. so, if this standard of truth is going to be able to stand on itself, it's going to have real world approach to things. You are going to have these physical locations. You are going to have this interplay between uh, Jewish thinking and um, secular thinking that was definitely going on in, in a lot of these uh, cities, in fact. But I think it's an extreme to take it to a point where you're saying, well, it's all metaphor and we can take it metaphorically or even to the point of symbolizing everything. Because even at the yeah. beginning of the description of the churches, you or more specifically assemblies, um, if we look at the, the Greek word more, more, more technically, is that um, right. Jesus is seen holding, um, walking among menorahs and holding stars. And that uh, there, there's, this, there's this element that goes on to play that, yeah, we can look at the menorah, we can see its symbolism, we can apply it back to even tabernacle thinking, um, which is very real. But I think it's definitely mm-hmm. a detriment to, to an individual, if not the, commun- the, the Christian community at large, to just vastly apply to the idea that oh this is just metaphorical and we can we can take it as if some i actually had one person say well i think revelation is the greatest fantasy portion of the bible because it's better than any fantasy book i've ever read so let me ask you this josiah why why do you think that there's such a push today um why are there so many people that try to completely analogize i I know i mispronounced that but (laughs) To completely say that revelation and all of eschatology either happened in 70 AD or is complete metaphor and is just a a picture of how empires rise and fall. What what is the push? Why do people do that? Well, in my experience, and I'm not working off any sort of scholarship standing here. This is just my personal experience. It's due sure. to a fact that they don't understand it. It's, it's an element of ignorance, but it's not ignorance entirely. It's them being able to read a book and say, well, this is my cultural approach to this type of reading. Um, and uh, I think that also a factor that plays into this is that what we've got going on here is that this is an Eastern book with Eastern thinking, Eastern metaphor, and so on. And so I think an additional struggle that can, as, again, can go into a little bit of an ignorance matter here is that for a lot of Christians, they don't understand the Jewish element that's at play behind Scripture, especially here in Revelation. I've, oh my word, the, the classes I've taken over the years, especially in higher education, when we, <laughs> when we came to Revelation, it was this book of, oh, what do we do with this thing? How do we engage with it? How do we interact with it? And I think for some people, it it can be intimidating, to say the least. But at another part of going, what application does this have to my religious, spiritual development, or even my relationship with God, or my church, or so on? I mean, isn't this either complete um, fantasy, or does it have any historical bearing? People lack the ability to make a connection of relevancy between this book especially and their life. And so I think what becomes the starting point for them is their life. And so they're approaching it by way of how they would read it, how they would understand it. And I I personally know some people who have, who, who have gotten so involved in the book on such a personal level that they basically lose themselves 
and they lose the point, the very thesis of the book, which I would actually like to read real quick because I think when we have a thesis, when we have a starting point, it can provide the framework in moving forward in, in what, whatever setting or whatever focus we have that we're going on. And that's simply yeah. in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. This is the revelation which God gave to Jesus, the Messiah, so that he could show his servants what must happen very soon. He communicated it by sending his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God, to the testimony of Jesus, the Messiah, as much as he saw. Blessed are the reader and hearers of the words of this prophecy, provided they obey the things written in it, for the time is near. So when when I was in a conversation one time with a relative, actually, and we start talking about the the dynamics of Revelation and how their, their approach to it was, and I brought up this verse, and they said, no, that's not in there, is it? And that's why I went and read this, because I think it's all too common, too, to take on what you already know and just continue to rehash it over your mind without actually going back to the source multiple times to glean from it, but rather you continue to glean from your own imagination, which I think is sad for one reason. Mm -hmm. um, because, of course, you, you lose this reality, this connection to Jesus, especially with that word obey. Um, who would think that Revelation, even these churches, could provide instruction and guidance as to what to do and how to do it? Right? And what not to do. And what not to do. Exactly. Exactly. And so, yeah. I, but then there's a wide range of people's approach to it. What, what has been your experience in, in the people that you've engaged with in your own personal experience with the book of Revelation and specifically these churches? Specifically with the churches, I think yeah. a lot of people are interested. And, uh, and when I teach Revelation class um, through through uh, congregation and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the churches are fascinating. Everybody loves the history and the background and mm -hmm. learning where, what ge geographically made this city unique, why Jesus referred to specific elements of their city specific and their culture specifically, um, not just Middle Eastern culture, not just culture of Asia Minor, but th that city in particular. All of that is all very interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But helping people see that it's really important that we we see that the primary difficulty that each of these churches was facing is not to compromise right. and it ends with the church that does compromise right and so uh, but also with the book of revelation at large i found that a lot of people are afraid of it mm -hmm. either because mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense and they're not sure how to make it make sense right and or there's some some gnarly stuff going on in in the revelation sure. and if you're not a hundred percent sure of who you are in christ and what your role is going to be in the middle of this it oh, can be yes. pretty scary oh yes so i think a lot oh, of yes. people uh make it analogy make it metaphor turn it into fantasy mm -hmm. because facing it as a true reality is mm -hmm. is too terrifying right Right, I would agree, and I think that, that that can definitely take away from the message that we've already seen at play here, because as I said earlier, you, you've got an introduction in each of the letters. Um, it, it starts with a, a focus on Jesus on some matter. Um, mm -hmm. With Ephesus, you have him holding and walking among the, the menorahs and, and holding the stars. You've got him being the first and the last. Um, you've got him as a, a, a double-edged sword uh, for the third one, Thyatira, you've got him being the son of God with eyes and feet that are the way they are, um, the fiery flame of eyes and the burnished brass of feet. And then in Sardis, you've got the uh, sevenfold spirit of God and seven stars and their inner workings with, the, with, with Jesus. Um, and then in Philadelphia, you've got the key, key of David and how it opens and closes. And then finally in Laodicea, you have the faithful, the true witness and the ruler of God's creation. And so... Right. Um, what, what better way to be able to first start our approach into these letters than with an understanding of Jesus and how 
that element of him, that identification, would 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 um, mean something to us, and how we can rely on that element of Jesus and who he's portraying himself to be in that. Excuse me, not portraying himself to be. This is who he is. Right. It even goes. Uh, I know that Lord of the Rings is really big right now, and, and you even go, uh, you can go back to the conversation between Gandalf and Bilbo. Um, mm. And he goes, well, my name is Gandalf. If you, and I can't remember the exact wording, but it, although you may not remember me by that name or know that I belong to it, which I always thought was mm. an interesting way, a statement here, because we can see how these identifiers belong to Jesus. And how, as Jesus in each of these roles commands not only the authority that he does in being able to tell the churches what he's saying to them through John, but also the command he has in bringing, as he said in one of the letters, bringing them back to their first love. And that was doing the commandments, obeying the commandments. And yeah. so I, I think that as we as we the question before what what is this about with with modern believers yeah there's fear there's an element of ignorance at play um and i think i hate to say it but it's something i've actually dealt with in my in my own personal life is the lack of developed relationship that they have with god and with jesus especially in these areas that he's identified with would mm -hmm. you agree when you say they, do you mean the churches or do you mean modern believers? Both. Okay. Both. I, I think both is at play here because I, I, as we both know and we read through scripture, it's so easily, the people are so easily distracted and they go back to yeah. familiar things. We see that in at Sinai for them saying, oh yeah, we'll, we'll agree. And then all of a sudden they turn around and have a big party and go, you know what? This is the God we're going to worship. It's like, okay. Yeah. But it, there is that general and I think, I think the the structure of each letter is also um, is also helpful in in answering the question you just asked. Mm -hmm. We our focus should be on mm -hmm. Jesus and who He is, mm -hmm. then on His instruction, right? Then on application. This is how you become an overcomer, mm -hmm. and the rewards for you if you are an overcomer, mm -hmm. and then go do it. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Exactly. It always has to start with Jesus and who he is and what he says and then live accordingly. Mm -hmm. If we lose order of that or if we try, if, if the goal is reverse, I want to be an overcomer. What steps do I have to take? And my priority isn't who is Jesus, who is God. Mm -hmm. It's not going to work. It right. never, ever will. It has to start with Jesus. It has to start with Jesus. Interesting that you would use those words because when you said the, the how the letters are formatted, the technical uh, formatting of these letters is a lawsuit. Um, <laughs> the, the judicial language that's uh, basically brought up in these is that there's an accusation involved. And how they have broken part of their covenant, and covenant covenantal thinking is not. Is, well, let's admit it; it's not very prominent or much part of modern evangelical thinking. But uh, regard, right. regardless of that, there, there is still to say that Jesus is bringing to them um, a legal issue, but at the same time, it's a relational one. You'd almost Absolutely. expect this to be taking place in a divorce court, <laughs> so to speak. Right. And so here's Jesus. It's in, 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 I really like how you put that because if we're going to look at it as a divorce court, so to speak, here's Jesus addressing his bridegroom, excuse me, his bride. And right. he's bringing to their attention what they have, um, this done against their own covenantal, uh, um, I'm losing my train of thought. Oh no. Uh, their covenantal commitment. There's the word that I was looking for. Their covenantal commitment, right. which is why it becomes so much more interesting that in another portion of Revelation, it says that the bride has made herself ready. Yes. And so it goes to reason 
that if the bride is to make herself ready, the bride needs to also be more aware of what she's doing and how it's affecting her relationship to her soon to be husband. Right. And so, um, I think in that, in that light, these letters become not just legal ones, but to a sense, if we're going to use that, 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 that concept of, of a marital relationship, these become love letters. Mm -hmm. In the sense that this is heartbroken love letters. Exactly. This is where we're at, but this is where I want to be. I want to be over Mm -hmm. here. Not, not where we're at now over here. And, one of the amazing things of what God does throughout scripture is that he continues to let mankind make that decision. Doesn't force it upon them. Let him who has the ear hear and obey. He's not mm-hmm. forcing it on anybody, which I think is this, these letters become a great example of that against modern argument who would say, Oh, God's just a bully. He's a five-year-old with a, with a stick and he's ready to play whack-a-mole with you whenever you do something that goes against him. But and, or I'm, I'm going to jump in on that please. one. Yeah, yeah. That perspective or the pendulum swung the other direction of God just wants to be your buddy. He's already taken care of everything you need. All you need to do is hear. You don't need to obey. There's nothing mm-hmm. for you to obey. Mm-hmm. The, and that I think that's even more predominant in, in evangelicalism right now, because as you just referenced in Revelation 19, the bride has made herself right. ready fine linens bright and clean were given to her to wear and then the parathetical statement the fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints yes how often do we hear from from big mainstream pulpits from mega churches these days that there are righteous acts that need to be done Mm. versus god's already taking care of it for you you're good to go you've got your fire insurance (laughs) god just wants to make your life happy and work for you no no we need to be doing our part Mm -hmm. this is a two-way relationship yes his cross has made it so that we can have access to god so that we can have relationship Mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean it when i married my wife we exchanged vows and just because she's being faithful to her end does not mean that i can be unfaithful to mine and everything's going to be fine Right. I, I need to be faithful to my vows as well. Right. That's how relationship works. Right. And, and um, I think another element that, that tends to happen in relationships, I was, uh, you, you go to church on a Sunday and, and you see crosses. And um, I remember how I would have these interactions with some, some people and they would say that, that, that explains my entire relationship with God. It's like, okay, I can understand what you mean by that, but it would be just the same as if I was to sum up my entire marriage in the in my wedding ring. That right. this is going to be my sole focus of the wedding ring, and as a result, I ended up getting distracted from the woman I'm married to. Right? Right. So, yeah. I, I, Absolutely. I completely agree and, with you there. And I'm going to add to that. Our, our sole focus should not be the cross, just like our, the focus of our marriage should not be a wedding ring. But right. also, if our focus is on the cross, our focus is completely historical. And we, mm-hmm. we, we know that he rose from the dead. We know that he ascended and we know that he's coming back. But practically, do we actually live like that? Yeah. Is, is our focus that he has done everything? He has conquered fear and death. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. Mm-hmm. And our groom is coming back for us. Mm-hmm. the king of everything who's going to set everything right is coming back for us yeah. he's going to take us through the revelation it's going to be extremely difficult but we need to go through that because if you look out at the world today the church is not ready we are not wearing bright and clean garments no we're not and it's a the con- church needs the the tribulation in order to to be refined just like proverbs says Right. Gold that passes through a fire gets refined. Yes. Yes. And and that's what conflict does, right? It, it, it ends up refining you. It ends up forcing you to ask yourself some of these, these more basic yet harder questions to answer, such as your very first one, which is just such a pact. I think one of those most basic ones is what are we doing and why? What would have happened yeah. if these, congreg- these congregations, these assemblies in these letters 
had had that mentality of going, maybe we should ask ourselves, what are we doing and why? But then that's not common. That's not that's not the everyday norm for somebody to ask themselves that question. We're not in a self-analytic, curious-minded mode. No, we're not, unfortunately. Right. But I think that um, one of the things we can do with this is realize is that God's not quiet. Jesus is not quiet. And that while we may continue to place our relationship in him historically or even metaphorically, he is still talking. He is still Absolutely. interacting. And if his word is still alive and active today, then we can look at these, these, these letters and we can see the person of Jesus Christ, who he is and what he would be to us and our own shortcomings. Yeah, we'll see those. But, but then we get to see who we're focusing on, right? Yes. And amen and amen. Amen and amen to that. And what, what better way to continue to develop a relationship where you end up trusting Jesus all the more for who he is and the call he's put on you to come back to him over and yes. over and over again. And I think that's a, yes. a good point to end on, I think, because what, what better way for us to see Scripture working than by bringing us back to Jesus over again? Absolutely. So. Absolutely. And with that, that's our time for today, folks. Mm -hmm. So as always, please, uh, if you have thoughts, comments, questions, concerns, any kind of feedback, shoot us an email at beardedbiblebrothers at gmail.com. We'd love to answer those. I think what we're going to do, we've been we've been sharing with you as we've been going through this, send us your stuff and we'll, we'll uh, talk about it on the podcast. I think what we're going to do actually is at the end of this seven-part eschatology series, I think we're going to have one where we address all of the comments and questions and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. in order for episode eight to have any content, we need you to send us stuff. So write yes. to us, tell us what you're thinking and, uh, and other, other thoughts, comments, questions you have. So again, that's bearded Bible brothers at gmail.com. And until next time, God bless and keep following Jesus. Mm -hmm.